Chicago has been known by many names. The second city, the windy city, the city of big shoulders. However, the nickname that caught my attention was the candy capital of America. Throughout Chicago's history, we have been home to many of the great American candy manufacturers. Mars, Wrigley, Tootsie, just to name a few. Although the presence of these companies alone wasn't the only reason why we were dubbed the candy capital. In fact, the history of candy in Chicago dates back to the very beginning of our city, when in 1837, Joseph Moore opened a store selling candy on what is now Wacker and Wells. Back then, the majority of candy was produced by boiling sugars, providing a large selection of hard candies. Granulated sugar, maple syrup and molasses were used to create taffy, butterscotch and rock candy. These were available in flavours such as lemon, mint, cherry, lavender and maple. In addition, popcorn, nuts, ice cream and macaroons could also be found in store. In the 1840s, the sale of candy was done in a very small way, as the population of the city was just over 4,000 people. Businesses came and went quickly because they were unsure if Chicago was going to turn into anything more than the swampy frontier city that it currently was. Little did they know that Chicago would change sooner than they expected. In 1848, with the completion of the Illinois-Michigan Canal, Chicago had an unprecedented growth spurt. Chicago started as a waterway hub, and its transportation-based advantages only increased with the construction of the railroads. What did this mean for candy manufacturers? Well, the goods from the farmers of the Midwest came to Chicago first before going anywhere else. Milk from Wisconsin, cornstarch and corn syrup from Illinois and Iowa, and sugar beets from Michigan. If it wasn't made locally, it could easily be sourced through our efficient transportation network. It wasn't just goods coming to Chicago. Immigrants flocked to our city. Our population of 4,000 residents would increase 20-fold in just 20 years. A city with a growing population, armed with access to the freshest ingredients at the cheapest prices, we were on our way to becoming the candy capital, a journey that wouldn't be an easy one. In 1871, our city faced our first greatest challenge, the Chicago Fire. In October of that year, three square miles of Chicago was destroyed by fire. With 300 people dead and 100,000 homeless, many businesses were lost. In 1870, there were 17 confectionery manufacturers in the city. 13 of these succumbed to the fire. Just like the city, they rose again from the ashes, and in the end, only four had ceased operations altogether. With the new start, the manufacturers adapted, investing in machines that were the product of the Industrial Revolution. Steam-powered engines were powering belt-driven mixing machines. Production increased, and soon, thanks to how well-connected we were, Candy made right here in Chicago was being consumed all over the nation. Around this time, a German immigrant arrived in Chicago and he didn't see ruins, he saw potential. Frederick Ruchenheim took his life savings of $200 and started his own popcorn and confectionery company. Business was so popular, he asked for his brother Louis to come from Germany to join him. Although business was strong, it would take them 20 years to discover their flagship product. Other companies were doing quite well in Chicago as well. John Krantz ran a very successful ice cream and confectionery parlor on State Street, which was equal or better than any in Chicago. Business became more popular with every year and required more and more employees. Krantz was not only popular in Chicago, he shipped his goods to nearly every state in the union. Charles Gunther, who is said to be responsible for the popularity of caramels in America, operated a store at the McVickers Theatre until a fire consumed the building in 1890. Not only was Gunther an extremely successful confectioner, he was an eccentric collector of Civil War memorabilia, which he showed off at a museum above his store before he moved it all to Libby Prison, a Confederate prison he had bought and reconstructed here in Chicago. The Bunt brothers came to Chicago and started with a small kettle in a back room. Soon they were operating a six-story factory. Brothers Ferdinand and Gustav started the business along with Charles Spohr, who had all previously worked for John Krantz. In the 1880s, Chicago had over 24 confectionery establishments that were doing more than $3 million a year. Every man and his dog was trying to get into the business. A cheaper and inferior quality candies flooded the market. The Chicago Tribune noted the use of scrapings, which was sugar that had adhered to the ship during the voyage, was then scraped off and sold as scrapings for a much cheaper price. Even more concerning to the public was the use of poisonous metals in small quantities to colour the candy. Vermilion, lead and copper were all widely used. 
There was public panic, and Chicago responded. The National Confectionery Association was formed here in 1884 to stamp out the production of adulterated confectionery. Through their efforts, they established stringent laws in many states and even offered a reward of $100 for information in convicting those known to be using inferior or hazardous ingredients. The association, which was established by representatives of 69 confectionery manufacturing firms, had their first meeting at Chicago's Palmer House. The city was growing, and in 1890 it was announced that Chicago would host the World Columbian Exhibition. To put on a World's Fair in just three years' time that rivaled its predecessor in Paris, where the Eiffel Tower was unveiled, was said to be impossible. To surpass it, well, that'd be nothing short of a miracle. It was here in Jackson Park in 1893 that the World's Fair took place, and with the whole world watching, Chicago managed to pull it off. Attended by over 27 million people, the exhibition, dubbed the White City, brought the whole world to Chicago. And with it, some candy legends were born. Wrigley's Mineral Scouring Soap had a booth in the Agricultural Hall, which was regarded as quite the spectacle. The exhibit was in the shape of a pyramid made from bars of soap. It featured a life-size wax statue of a neat modern housewife laundering the merits of the soap. Two years prior, and with only $32 in his pocket, William Wrigley Jr. arrived in Chicago with his wife and five-year-old daughter. He started by selling his father's soap, offering a free umbrella, picture frame, or box of gum if you bought a certain amount of soap. Soon the gum was outselling the soap, and he started selling that instead. Some say that Wrigley developed his juicy fruit flavor the year of the exhibition. I'm sure he could have been found next to the soap, offering it as a premium for any purchase. Likewise, the Rukenheim brothers were said to be selling their popcorn at the fair. Three years later, Lewis would perfect the recipe for the Cracker Jack. It was said that it got its name when a salesman tried it, he exclaimed, that's a Cracker Jack. Well, that's excellent. In 1908, it was immortalized in song, and the rest is history. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. I don't care if I never get back. Let me root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Perhaps the exhibition's greatest effect on the confectionery world was when 30-year-old Milton Hershey saw the chocolate-making machines. He was so impressed, he didn't let the fact that he didn't know how to make chocolate affect him from actually purchasing all those machines. The first recipe he made that was somewhat palatable became the Hershey bar. And it's what Americans think chocolate tastes like today, this tangy, sour sort of taste. I'm not going to eat this one. By the end of the century, we had 76 confectionery manufacturers in Chicago and 201 in Illinois. Some say this was around the time when we were dubbed the candy capital. In reality, this couldn't have been further from the truth. Illinois was third behind New York and Pennsylvania in terms of product value. In just nine years, we would slip to fourth place as Massachusetts took second. Chicago had a lot of catching up to do, and luckily, we had the right people to do it. Sal Ferreira immigrated to Chicago in 1900, where he soon opened his own bakery. He was selling Italian pastries and candies. Soon the candies were out selling the pastries and they moved to a new location. They moved here to Taylor Street and the bakery is still open to this day. Before they had to move to a larger location, Farapan was located upstairs. This is where they used to make a selection of traditional and sweet candies. The Ferrara family went on to create Jawbreakers, Boston Baked Beans, Red Hots, Lemonheads and more. Lemonheads, which Nello Ferrara named after the birth of his son, who he said had the head the shape of a lemon when he was born. Emil Bruck left his job with John Krantz in 1904 and opened his first store, Palace of Sweets. Business took off when he started selling wholesale caramels to department stores such as Rothschild & Company and Siegel Cooper & Co. In two years, they were forced to find a larger facility to accommodate demand. Not only were his caramels popular, Bruck's is largely considered to have popularized candy corn in America. By 1911, they were producing 50,000 pounds of candy a week. And in 1923, he had four candy factories operating at capacity. His largest, a 600,000 square foot factory, which cost over $5 million to build, was located at 4656 West Kinsey Street. 12 additions were built over 30 years and the site employed over 3,000 people. In 2007, it was destroyed in the best way possible. The administration building was used as part of the Gotham City Hospital in the film, The Dark Knight.
In 1900, Milton Hershey introduced the Hershey's Bar. It was produced in Derry Church, Pennsylvania, which changed its name to Hershey, along with the introduction of the Hershey's Kisses six years later. The Hershey's Bar was the first mass-produced American candy bar, although it wouldn't be that way for long. We'd come a long way in candy manufacturing, and although traditional candies were still very prevalent, the candy bar was new, and the public wanted it. The Brunt brothers released the Tango's Bar in 1914, a maple marshmallow candy bar with nuts. It swept the nation, selling for a nickel, the same price as the Hershey's Bar. For years, candy bars would cost five cents. The price was so sacred that manufacturers would rather increase or decrease the size of the candy bar as the cost of the ingredients fluctuated. A new candy bar would have to be something very special to sell for more than a nickel. Well, that's exactly what George Williamson thought when he introduced the O. Henry. Williamson, who started his own candy store in 1917, Three years later, he introduced the O. Henry. Advertising played a key role in convincing the public to spend twice the usual amount to buy it. The campaign proved successful, and in two years' time, they were producing 5 million O. Henry bars a month. It was said to be named after a young man who used to flirt with the female staff at the candy store, to which they would reply, O. Henry. Otto Schnurring named his company after his mother, Helen Curtis, founding the Curtis Candy Company in 1916. He introduced the candy cake around 1919. By adding peanuts and nougats to the recipe, he created the Baby Ruth Bar, which was trademarked in 1923. The name capitalized on the popularity of the famous baseball star Babe Ruth. In fact, Babe Ruth later tried to sue Curtis Candy. Schnurring denied any relation, stating that the candy bar was named after Grover Cleveland's late daughter Ruth. Chicago was soon flooded with candy bar brands, which were each fighting for their share in the market. In the city alone, there was 105 different candy bars to choose from. The O. Henry was the most popular one. And to be noticed, you really had to be advertising. As William Wrigley said, tell them quick and tell them often. Snurring emblazoned Baby Ruth on buildings and billboards across the country. He even had aeroplanes bomb major American cities with Baby Ruth bars attached to tiny parachutes. Paul Tibbetts Jr. at the age of 12 had his first aeroplane ride throwing Baby Ruth candy bars with paper parachutes attached from a biplane flying over a crowd gathered at the Haley Horse Track in Miami. From that day on, he knew he had to fly. And in 1945, he flew a Nola Gay over Hiroshima, which dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan. The Baby Ruth was a huge success, and the Curtis Candy Company did it again in 1929 with the Butterfinger Candy Bar. By 1931, sales of Baby Ruths were as high as $1 million a month. Wrigley was spending millions on ads and had one of the largest multi-year advertising deals in the world. Any town or city with over 2,500 people would have at least one outdoor Wrigley ad. Twice, Wrigley collected all names in the telephone book and sent them a free sample of gum. His Times Square neon billboard had an annual electric bill of over $100,000. At the beginning of the 1920s, Illinois regained its place as the third largest confectionery manufacturing state, just behind Massachusetts, although we were leagues behind New York. The boost that the candy industry needed came about in a unique way. It was a side effect of prohibition. Between 1920 and 1930, the production, importation, transportation and sale of alcohol was strictly forbidden. In an effort to survive, drinking establishments converted to selling candy, soda and ice cream. Brewers began producing syrups and sodas. Malt made its way into ice cream. Hundreds of confectionery stores popped up in Chicago. Andrew Canolis opened Andy's Candies in 1921 and sold a variety of chocolates including nougats, raisin clusters, budges and nuts. Around 1950, Andy's Candies had 47 Chicago confectionery stores, factory on North Clark, and a brand new product, Andy's Chocolate Mint. Similarly, Mrs. Snyder's had 17 stores. Opened by Aura Snyder, who started her business when her husband became ill, she became known for her homemade candies, selling through her stores downtown. Over on Madison in the Chicago building, Demet's Candies were selling their famous turtles. Although they didn't invent the turtles, they were smart enough to trademark the name after one staff member proclaimed upon seeing the chocolate that they looked just like turtles. Fannie Mae opened their first store in 1920 and in five years, the creator Henry Teller Archibald had opened another 30. In 1946, they would release Pixies, a caramel chocolate pecan candy for only $1.25 a pound. In 1920, the American Licorice Company, located on Chicago's northwest side, started producing classic raspberry vines. 32 years later, they would rebrand them and sell them as red vines. In 1928, Milton Holloway was trying to make the perfect round caramel and chocolate candy. He found this impossible, producing nothing but duds. So he decided to sell them instead, and milk duds were born right here in Chicago. 
Marshall Field's signature candy came about in 1929 when they bought Seattle department store Frederick and Nelson, and with it came Frango Mints. For 70 years, they were made on the 13th floor at the flagship store on State Street. In 1927, Illinois became the largest manufacturer of candy in America, and Chicago took its crown as the candy capital of America. We did it by having access to the best ingredients, the best mines, and also having the best transportation network. Mars moved to Chicago in 1927. In 1930, Mars released the Snickers bar, and a few years later, the Three Musketeers. Mars also bought up a local candy store, Dove Candies, in 1986, as they were making a killing selling their chocolate-covered ice creams. Henry Bloomer also wanted to take advantage of Chicago's market, and with his brothers, he opened up the Bloomer Chocolate Factory, and it still stands today, having opened in 1939. It's the reason why downtown Chicago smells like chocolate on certain days. And Tootsie, while synonymous with Chicago, originated in New York, and they didn't move here until 1966. By 1943, Illinois was producing 40% of the United States candy, 737 million pounds of it. And it would be more, because there was no way to measure the hundreds of independent creators that were selling their own homemade confectionery. Chicago companies were doing well, the Brunt brothers were selling 50 million pounds of candy a year, and Brock's Candy Company was doing double that. Mars and Curtis Candy Company were both producing more than a million candy bars a day. The biggest players wanted to get even bigger, and over the next 50 years, the rates of mergers and acquisitions increased dramatically. Starting off simply, the American Licorice Company is still independent, producing Red Vines and Sour Punch in Indiana. The Bunt brothers were purchased by Chase Candy Company, who produces Cherry Mash and other classics in St. Joseph, Missouri. Fannie Mae bought up Mrs. Snyder's Candies and Andy's Candies. Fannie Mae is now owned by 1-800-Flowers and is about to sell to Ferrero. While Mrs. Snyder's Candies are no longer, Andy's Candies and the signature Creme de Menthe Mint were sold to Tootsie. Tootsie, who still has a factory in Chicago, produces their classics along with other brands such as Junior Mints, Double Bubble and Charleston Chew. Brax was acquired by Ferrara Pan, who still has their factory in Oak Park. Along with their classic brands, they also produce Trolley, Chuckles, Black Forest, and more. Ferrara Pan is actually owned by a private equity firm, El Chatterton, who owns other non-confectionery bands, including P.F. Chang's, Corpower Yoga, Build a Bear, and so much more. Demet's Candy Company is now owned by Yidzel Holding, a Turkish conglomerate who owns a large portfolio of brands, including McVitie's, Gavita Chocolate, and United Biscuits. Now for the biggest players in the confectionery industry, Nestle bought Curtis Candy Company and Williamson Candy Company and now produced the O. Henry, Baby Ruth and Butterfinger, along with their wide selection of drinks and ice creams. Cracker Jacks is now owned by Frito-Lay, whose parent company is PepsiCo, and, well, they produce a large selection of beverages and snacks. Hershey's now makes Milk Duds along with their classics and many new additions. Hershey's denied a buyout by Mondela's International last year, who owns Cadbury, Oreos and other brands a deal that, if approved, would have formed the largest candy company in the world. That title belongs to Mars, who in 2008 acquired Wrigley for a reported $23 billion. Through this series of mergers and acquisitions, it's hard to say if Chicago still retains its title as the candy capital. Mars, Verapan and Tootsie still have strong connections with the city. And although the National Confectionery Association moved to Washington DC in 2008, they still hold their annual Sweets and Snacks Expo here where more than 760 different companies attend, and they discuss the new trends that are happening in the confectionery marketplace. Independent stores like Candiality are on the rise, and there's a whole bean-to-bar movement. Where makers are buying raw cacao beans to create their products from scratch, a highly labor-intensive process to ensure the quality and flavor by controlling every stage in the production of their chocolate. They have then gone on to create new and exotic flavors of candy, it's a trend that even larger companies have responded to, with M&M's releasing a chili nut and a coffee nut flavour in a competition last year. Another popular growing area of the market has been ice cream parlours, with new stores opening recently, and some that have been open since the 20s and 30s, such as Margie's and Rainbow Cone on the south side. These businesses, along with independent establishments, marks a new chapter in the history of Chicago candy, a chapter which is reminiscent of our city's very first independent candy makers, inventors and entrepreneurs. It'll always be Sweet Home Chicago, although now I hope it got a whole lot sweeter. This film couldn't have been finished without the help of Leslie Goodard, who wrote the book on Chicago candy, or Jason Lyberg from CollectingCandy.com. It is written, directed, produced and edited by yours truly, with help from the Chicago Public Library and the Chicago History Museum.
Yes, my mum did tell me not to speak with my mouth full. I'm sorry for that, mum. If you like videos about Chicago history, check out the other videos on my channel. Also like and subscribe. I'll see you again soon.